Commissioner Randall, and then the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Connor Merck. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come before thee this night, we are so grateful for all of the many blessings in life that thou has given to us. We're grateful for the bounties of life that thou provides, for the safety in which we've been able to arrive here. We're thankful, Father, for those who serve in the military, who those first responders who serve us and take care of us, and who are the ones we call when times are rough. We ask that thou will bless them and watch over them, take care of them as they do their duties. We ask for a blessing, Father, on those who in this county have been struck with tragedy over the last two weeks. May thou watch over and protect their families. May, thou find, may they find comfort in thee. As tonight, Father, as we talk amongst ourselves and do the business of the county, we ask that we will listen to each other, that we will be mindful of the opinions, and may we always re be respectful. Father, as we return home this night, we ask that we will do so in safety that we will return to our families, that they who support us and watch over us. We ask for these things, Father, humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Merck. Thank you, Com Commissioner Randall. Now we'll move on to roll call of members. Uh, Commissioner English? Uh -huh. Commissioner Apicella? Here. Commissioner McPherson? Here. Commissioner Bain? Here. Commissioner Benich? Here. Myself? Commissioner Boswell? Here. Commissioner Randall? Here. Madam Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Commissioner English. Um, now we will move on to any declarations of disclosure or disqualification. Would anyone like to mention any? Okay, moving on. Now we're going to move on to the public hearings portion, or public presentations portion of tonight's meeting. This is where if you're here tonight on any item other than one of the public hearings, and since we do have a bit of a crowd, the public hearings tonight are on the road name change for Big Spring Lane and the conditional use permit for Patriots Crossing Car Wash. So if you're here to speak about anything other than those two items, now would be the time that you can come down to the podium. You'll have three, mi three minutes to address the commission. When the green light comes on, you can start talking. Please state your name, address, and the district that you reside. When the yellow light starts blinking, you have one minute left. And when the red light comes on, please um, end your comments. So at this time, would anyone like to come down? OK, remember those directions for later then. <laughs> All right, so now, um, since there's no public presentations, we'll move on to the public hearings portion of tonight's meeting. And this is going to be on the proposed um, Ordinance 018-04, which is the Big Spring Lane name change. And for this, we recognize staff Ms. Andrea Hornung. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the commission. What I'd like to do is give you a, just a brief update of how we got here. Uh, last year, there was a site plan for a commercial piece of property. <clears throat> and I will get to... I thought I turned this on. Sorry, excuse me. Um, this will be the uh, index of official road names for Big Spring Lane, and the ordinance that we have is proposed ordinance 0-1804. Thank you. I guess it's not working. Anyway, this is uh, this shows the parcels in question. The uh, two parcels here, B and C, are the ones that are owned by Kelvick Construction, and they had a site plan under review last year and eventually approved. And part of the uh, requirements of approval is that this uh, segment of Big Spring Lane in green, which is the private easement that uh, serves all the parcels along this to terminating at 38100 at the top, at the northern part of this graphic, that that should be named because once you have more than one structure addressed off of a, a road or an easement, it is recommended that the road be named so that E911 and Fire and Rescue can adequately find the structures that are addressed off this road. And since the 
lower part, the yellow, is Big Spring Lane that is the public right of way that occurred during the development of Tridex, which is toward the bottom of this graphic at the end of that cul-de-sac. <coughs> and uh, I have another graphic. Can you please forward? Um, the graphic to the left shows uh, several yellow dotted lines. Those show several easements. At the time when the site plan was approved, the easement to the rear of the property going from here was presumed to be the access, which was the reason for allowing the owner to name the road. As we got to final approval and signature of the plan, realized that this is the segment over here to the left, which is the former Big Spring Lane that ends at the parcel 38100. So with that, since the plan was approved and to not hold up the permits and the appro further approvals of the project, uh, staff decided that the, um, it would be allowed to have both names on the sign at the terminus, the intersection down here of the public property and the private property so that uh, neither occupants along that road who have an address would be impacted by 911 or mail service. That's the reason for, <coughs> excuse me, the signage that you see that shows Kelvick Lane and Big Spring. Prior to that, there was, was some signage that pointed in that direction for Big Spring Lane for the two, for the address of 175, because it wasn't clear since Tridex has 100 and 200 level addresses. So the addressing in that area was very confusing, and staff was trying to uh, assist in getting that resolved at the time until we, we started this public hearing process and went through the process to officially name uh, the easement of Kelvick. On uh, April, I'm sorry, March 14th, the public hearing uh, ensued where staff gave the information and the update of what transpired to get us here. And then the commission uh, decided to leave this public hearing open because we did have uh, two property owners speak. There was information in the packet of all the property owners along that segment receiving information uh, requesting a name change for that segment, where out of the ten property owners, some being the same, uh, two of them did not respond. So staff presented the top three names to the uh, Community Economic Development Community Economic Development Committee of the Board in which their recommendation was Kelvick Lane, which is why the ordinance specifies Kelvick Lane. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry, Kelvick Way. Um, so uh, before the, um, uh, the Planning Commission decided to keep the public hearing open, they requested that there be additional information uh, coming, requested of the Historic Commission because on that particular day, staff was uh, alerted, received information that uh, documented some possible historic activity on one of the parcels. And that information was provided and then also the staff report and all the supporting documents were submitted to the Historic Commission that met last week. And the information that was provided by the Historic Commission also um, added information about the Mineral Springs being an area of possible significance because of a well and um, some other information. I wanted to read that to you, what they noted. Since they discussed it on April 5th, they suggested Little Spring Lane Road or Way uh, also, one of the members researched the historical map prepared by Eugene Scheel, which is also in your uh, staff report, and found the area was his that historically contained a mineral spring. And there was reference to Mineral Spring Hill along Jeff Davis Highway, which is also Route 1. So the suggestion was made that maybe Mineral Spring or minimal Mineral Springs Road or Lane or Way could be, exist could be um, possible road names and then there are no existing street names that appear to conflict with this. So we don't have anything in our address database 
that would be confusing for Mineral Spring or Mineral, Mineral Springs Road Laneway, whatever the suffix would be. Also, there was a um, list of um, items in the staff report that uh, also clarified, <coughs> excuse me, the process for naming streets. And uh, with the guidelines being that um, they're assigned to all public and private vehicular accesses, serving typically more than one principal building. On non-residential properties, they are several of the buildings are addressed so that it's clarified which building might need the services or if they need addressing services, um, sorry, postal services. Also, when it's residential, that roads will be named when it serves more than two residential lots. In this case, we have one residential and one commercial. Uh, family serm names may be used also in the Cambridge Dictionary. The, the names could be come out of the Cambridge Dictionary. Uh, any modification could be approved by the planning department, the director of the planning. And changes in road names for street, road, avenue, boulevard, which is a suffix, do not have to follow the um, public hearing process, but can be subject to administrative. Now, if a citizen is aggrieved by the process, they can agree this to the county administrator and the appeal should be in writing and state the nature. Uh, also, there is a process to name a street, which is similar to the process staff use when contacting the adjacent property owners, is to send out uh, a request for the top three names and then it follows the public hearing process. And it could take uh, up to six months and typically uh, staff requests that 51% of the property owners or homeowners along that road agree on a name so that the, the top name can be provided to the board and the planning commission. The graphics that I provided also on this particular graphic, the other uh, graphic shows that this is a, uh, actually a 2018 aerial that we received, we have it in our um, ArcGIS. And from this term, the beginning of the intersection of Big Spring Lane Public and the Big Spring Lane Private, which is uh, noted as Kelvick Way, it's paved all the way up to and just about beyond the driveway into parcels 102 C and B. The terminus of this parcel right here, where I'm drawing the red line, that is the length that is about 1,353.65 feet in length. And then the remainder of this uh, road will go, that goes up to 38,100, which is in blue on the left graphic, that's approximately 536.88 linear feet. So uh, the total length is approximately 1,890 linear feet. The paved area of this road does not extend all the way to the Kelvic construction property, but just beyond the driveway. Can you forward it, please? I think I have some more. Uh, a few other uh, requests from the Planning Commission were of, um, are there any streets in the, lo in the county that might have multiple names or multiple streets having the same name. And in the top graphic uh, in the left, this one is the bridge actually over 95, but about midway through, to the left you have Ramoth Church Road and to the right you have American Legion Road. So that is one place that's near the airport or that's the, connect the shortest connection to the airport versus taking the um, Centerport Parkway exit that the road changes midway. <coughs> to, the top, to the top right, this is, this is Route 1 in which you have Jefferson Davis Highway and then after Cranes Corner and I believe that's Enon Road, you have, it changes to Cambridge Street which is going south on 1 toward Falmouth. <laughs> At the bottom left, we have Kellogg Mill, and actually beyond Kellogg Mill is Woodcutters Road that goes to Colonial Forge. Then at uh, 
Woodbine, I believe. Woodbine, Woodbine is to the right, and then continuing straight is Akakik Furnace Road, which this part of Akakik Furnace, a portion of that is private and a portion of that is public. To the right, we have another instance that is a bit different than the rest. You have a street segment that changes names frequently. So you have Morton Road here in blue, and then Morton Road continues at an intersection. Then prior to that segment, which is 624, that's Primer House Road, and down at the bottom, this is Leland. Uh, after Morton, then it branches off to Forbes Street again to the left and Forbes Street straighter to the right. Then it makes another right turn and Forbes goes all the way up to meet up with Route 1 or Cambridge Street. Then at the left portion, this is Lay Hill Road. So you can see in all these segments in the bottom how many times this particular road segment changes name, stays the same, or the same name changes at several intersections. Uh, can you please forward that? And then this is just one of the slides from the, the last uh, meeting that showed some instances of possible Civil War activity on the parcel that terminates, I mean at the parcel that's end of the terminus of the easement on this parcel. And I think I updated you on everything of where we're at till we till we got here from the staff report and the historic commission. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Ms. Hornung. Does anybody on the commission have any questions before we move on? Ms. Okay. Hornung, I have a, c a question or two. Yes, there, with those, um, you showed us those different roads that are changing and all that stuff. Fire rescue has no issues with that. Post office has no issues with that. Correct? No. What happens is if roads or road names have been changed. The ordinance is forwarded to the, um, not only fire and rescue, because uh, Andrew Milliken, who's a fire marshal, is very involved in when we're assigning addresses and changing road names, but that is also sent to the post office, and mm -hmm. we have USPS, and we have emails from the local USPS uh, off of Route 1, who is a connection so that a contact in order to make sure that all of the Fredericksburg or Stafford post offices receive the information, as well as the Richmond Central Office. So staff has tried to uh, be diligent in contacting USPS whenever we have an address issue in the county to correct it so that nobody is uh, lacking services from the county. So to your knowledge, and to your knowledge right now, there hasn't been any issues with us doing that? No. Okay. No. All these streets that I, uh, the that graphics that I out. showed you, have been in existence for quite a few years. Understood. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions on the commission? Mr. Randall? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, this road that you particularly were referencing that has several names to it, w when was the last action taken on those names? How long ago was it that we, we made that determination for that road? That might have been... Uh, five to eight years ago. I know it happened during my tenure here, and I've been here since 06. And I think it was before there were some ch staff changes in the addressing. So that was probably about about six to eight years ago. I don't recall exactly. Hornet, I believe it may have been longer than that because that road was realigned with the construction of the Leland Station neighborhood. And I believe it was in the early 2000s. So it's early. been more than a decade since that configuration okay. has existed is is this an is this what you would prefer as part of the county to to do this with roads is this something that we're okay with if you had your preference my preference yes well um, what we do is we try to follow the ordinance and uh, staff who are involved in assigning addresses are working very diligently not only with GIS so that there aren't mistakes made uh, we try to correct any other mistakes that we find and also working with the fire marshal because he is our contact with 911 and, and all the fire and emergency uh, staff so that we don't have any confusion with road names and addresses. And if we find any that conflict, that uh, they're not in the same, the correct um, linear um, 
designation for numbering, we try to correct those so that there's less or no confusion as best as we can. We try to have roads that are named that don't confuse with others in, in existence. Uh, we can't control what happens in other localities, but when we name roads, we try to make sure that even the syllables, the way they sound, even if they're spelt differently, there won't be any confusion if somebody is in need of services and they cannot pronounce it properly, that uh, emergency 911 will be able to find the location of that road. So we try to make sure we don't duplicate, and duplicate any. Uh, in the past, some subdivisions had the same road name that might have been Court Way or Lane, but um, in the last probably four years, we've tried to get away from that just to ensure that there's no confusion. Okay. Thank you. And then I have one, one further question. If you go back to one of your slides, um, you were talking about the original easement. Um, it was a bit in the beginning of your presentation. That's a couple of them. Can you go back one more, please? Oh, maybe fo here it is. Oh, there it is. To the, I'm looking at the, on the left. You said, if I remember, if I hear you right, that when the official, when the uh, first plan was d d brought to staff, that the assumption was that the second easement over to the right was what you thought you could get an access into that location. Uh, yes. What happened? The people who um, in uh, in the department who assign addresses are different from the people who actually review the plans. Okay. And so when working with fire and rescue. Uh, it was noted that the road has to change its name because you have multiple addresses on them. And when uh, staff had looked at it and the easements, it was presumed that maybe the road was here to the rear. And, and that was that what was we expected initial, to be Kelvin Way Kelvin right, Way initially. Right, that was the initial. But then after looking further and having uh, additional discussions, uh, staff was incorrect in that uh, presumption and that the road or a segment in question was this one in blue that accessed all these parcels and terminating at 38100. Okay, but right now we're talking about not terminating at 38100, terminating <coughs> it at 102, the 102 Bravo, is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mr. Bain? Um, yes. Uh, two <coughs> questions. If you could put that graphic back up real quick. Um, I, I don't recall, but all of the parcels along the private lane, except for 38100, are they zoned commercial? Uh, a majority of them are zoned M1 industrial. Industrial. But some of the parcels to the east, there is one parcel that is zoned A1 agricultural. And I think if we go back one slide, I think it has all the zoning designations, or two slides. Um, no, it's not on here, but uh, 103A, I believe, is the uh, A1 parcel, and everything along from here on down is all industrial. Industrial. All right. On and the right. <coughs> my other question, the, the private road right now, if we <coughs> decide on a name tonight, or if a name is ultimately decided on. It still remains private. Is that right? Correct. Oh, this okay. whole segment is private. <coughs> it's a, it still an easement that crosses all the properties, about 15 feet on each side. And so who is responsible for maintaining that road? Can you clarify that? All the property owners along that easement. Okay, they share that responsibility. Yes, because uh, the, the road uh, down here, this, sec this part of the road is on 102. And then this part is on 102E. But then if you go over here to the eastern part of it, that uh, 103A has all this length right. all the way up here. That's on their land. So that would be their responsibility. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? OK. So seeing no questions, um, we'll move to the public hearing portion of Tonight's, me uh, tonight's meeting, and this will be the public hearing for the name change for Big Spring Lane. So at this time, if you'd like to come down and speak, you'll have three minutes. Please state your name, address, and the district that you reside. And when the yellow light comes on, you'll have one minute left. 
And then when the red light comes on, um, that'll be the end of your, your comment period. So come on down. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Jenkins, and I represent Kelvick uh, Construction. Um, I submitted a letter, uh, which I hope was circulated to all of you. Um, and uh, of course, I, I won't repeat myself. Um, let me first hopefully uh, at least emphasize or clarify a few things. Um, all of the lots, 102 through 102F, which is all on the line that front on this particular, what we're calling the private segment, are all zoned M1. They were zoned M1 about 10 years ago, I believe. Um, most of the other uh, lots in the area, not all of them, are also, as you go back and forth on Big Spring, the public street, are also zoned M1 with a couple of ex exceptions. Um, also, um, the, the site plan that Kelvick submitted um, did not show uh, it, 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 that it was going to attempt to use any easement that's on the Tridex prop property. It always showed the easement where it is now, the private segment. Could be a little bit of confusion because there was, and I'm familiar with it because I was involved in the sale to Tridex some years ago, um, there was a possible alternative uh, shown on the Tridex property on, on some documents, but that was never pursued and it's never been built. It's a very tough area. It's actually got a lot of grade problems and it would be very difficult to do anything there uh, and Tridex would have to participate in it. And so that was never part of the site plan according to Mr. Zarn, who's the principal of, of Kelvick. Um, so I, I think then what, what may be uh, now in plain sight that, that we've had a chance to look at this is that there's really a solution here, and I, I think this, the, the main concern appears to be that Ms. Williamson, who owns the property to the, to the north, um, perhaps wants a different name. I mean, we, we can understand different preferences. Um, as I, when I, um, in my letter, I attached uh, uh, an aerial that I got from the GIS site uh, from Stafford and used the pictometry to show how her road is laid out on her, on her uh, property. And so if we take the examples of using different names on different segments, uh, there's obviously precedent in the county and in response to the questions, uh, it seems to pass muster. Uh, but it seems to me that in this particular case, it's even, it's even a more persuasive way to resolve this uh, preferences, these preferences, given the way the, it's laid out on Ms. Williamson's property. Because if you enter the property, you soon take a, a hard right so it's, it's, it's really close to a very close analogy to an intersection. It's, it's obviously not a true intersection because it's a private easement. Um, but it, 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 it would not be confusing to see that the name changes because you're taking a hard right. Um, so all along, it's only been the, what's the private segment properly understood, which is to her property line, that we request uh, the Kelvick name for. She would, I, I believe, and looking at the ordinance closely, uh, has naming opportunities uh, now or later for what is on her property, and I think it's perfectly logical, and I think reconciles everything. So, appreciate it. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Good evening, Dan Hicks, uh, 1002 Bailey Court, Rock Hill District. I'm here to support. Uh, the naming of the subject road to either um, Williamson Way, like we talked about last time, or uh, Mineral Springs Road or Lane. Mineral Springs or Lane sounds it's sane. I, I like the way that sounds, and it's bi it's unbiased. There's no, it's neutrality. It doesn't recognize one way or the other, except kind of looks back and uh, acknowledges some historical fact there. Um, I would like to again, Mineral Spring Lane is, is sounds acceptable. Is pretty good. I'd like to make a couple comments about the examples on the multiple roads. Those other examples that were shown actually delineate an action. Either it's either to the east or the west of 95 or, or some intersection from one intersection to intersection. So there is a delineation point. With the, this case, this road here, there is no delineation. It's, it's a one constant road. Now, Kelvick has uh, added a structure down there that is basically their address and their and their uh, access to their structure, which is understand, but it comes off of this access point or this access um, uh, easement. Now, it seems to me that the mistake was done earlier on when the application was first applied for, and I don't understand is why during the application process, that road that already existed that, that was part of the Williamson's address wasn't used for the permit, regardless of whether the access to the 
to the building construction site is, is irrelevant. It just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. So you, there was a road there. It had a name on it. They added the, uh, the structure number, and they should have gone with it. So again, um, I'd like to emphasize that as a resident, Stafford County, I don't, I, I oppose any organization or any business coming into the county and renaming the roads to benefit their company. Now, I could debate this with uh, anybody that wants to debate it, but an address with a company's name is an attribute that's positive, and it's, uh, it shows a, hey, bias. Now, all these other uh, uh, areas that are coming in, they may become construction, maybe uh, some business that comes in there, and they're going to have to adapt or use that name that, that, that comes uh, that's decided upon either tonight or whatever later date. So if they end up with Kelvick Lane, all these other businesses are also going to have to have an address that reflects Kelvick Construction. And instead of going with Mineral Springs or Williamson Lane, which is neutral, it's uh, something to consider, and I hope that the, uh, the uh, commissioners uh, consider that. And um, uh, even though this might be a, a minor subject, it, I think it's important. I think we need to put our foot in the sand now and say, you know, Stafford County is ran by uh, commissions and, and board of supervisors, not uh, not individuals coming in and say, hey, I'll go to the post office and I'll change my address. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angelita Crawford, and I'm a Virginia State resident. I'm here on behalf of Margareta Williamson, and I wanted to state that, as last time, Andrea Hornan stated the, the staff made a mistake and wanted to appease both property owners and deciding to name the roads. Um, it's always easier to ask for forgiveness and ask for permission la um, later. Um, it's something that I've always heard used um, with working for um, county government. Um, and I've also volunteered with Falk Hare um, Fire and Rescue. Um, in this case, uh, it would be nice if taxpayer dollars were stopped being um, wasted and it was corrected. And so being diligent in 911 and fire marshal um, in asking that everything being done um, correctly, that this confusion be cleared up and it be um, entirely named Mineral Springs so that uh, this control, uh, this situation is controlled correctly and policy be and procedure be followed um, like it should have been done in the first place, like uh, maybe somebody could done a site visit and um, been out there to see that they occupied this um, 56 Big Spring Lane and operated Kelvick out of that home that existed on Big Spring before they were uh, building their facility there. Um, and um, they were turning everything in to um, Stafford County. Um, they have not graveled the entire way to her gate as that was misinformed um, last time at the meeting. So I, again, I don't think uh, somebody from there has been out to see all that has been entirely done. Um, so I just uh, would like um, something neutral be proposed for the entire road and not confuse um, anyone with fire and EMS and um, n it not be granted because she has worked so hard to be here and to serve on the um, architectural review board uh, to save a portion of the Staff Stafford County Courthouse from destruction and served on the historical Fredericksburg Foundation and um, put so much time in here since 1963. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ms. Crawford. I am Margareta Williamson, and I live at 175 Big Spring Lane. I'm a historian by inclination and education. The gravel road I am trying to save is one lane wide, one car wagon ride, and um, it's only gravel. It goes to, I'm trying to keep the historic based, uh, it's been chopped down to about a half a mile up to my gate, 
However, the road continues on past my house, down past my old barn, and takes a left toward Akakee Creek. The remainders has now been paved. The uh, one question we have to ask is why, according to historian author Geraldine Eby, were such elaborate terraces made on my hills? What crops were raised and to whom delivered? Questions as yet unanswered. It is vital to retain parts of our past if for no other reason than to know where we have lived, how we have lived. I have also found Civil War artifacts in fields and flower beds showing that the Yankee army moved over these hills on their way to the courthouse. My mailbox is one mile from my house on abandoned US-1. Our addresses have been in conjunction with Eskimo Hill and since 1994, Big Spring Lane. Mr. Zarn's behavior regarding the post office and Google Maps have been deeply upsetting and came to my attention only within the past month. No one from the post office notified me of a street name change nor acknowledged the existence of my old house. I did tell Mr. Zorn a month ago I was not interested in moving my box to his site. Just a few days ago, the suggestion was made for the name Mineral Springs Hill Lane, based on a colonial map preference. Since this is historic, I will add it to my previous suggestions. Please do not change the name of an 18th century lane to non-historic Celtic. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williamson. Anyone else? My name is Darwin Crawford. I'm also a Virginia resident. And, um, I'll take care of Ms. Williamson. Um, I'm here to uh, say that she's been there since 1963. We live in a transit area. Stafford County has lots of military. She's been here since 1963, been a taxpayer for, to support this county. And here the county's gonna try to do something for somebody else to benefit a business. I managed a business here in the county um, for a couple years. And it's sad that we, the county, yes, we all have to grow. We ta need tax dollars to be able to build, build buildings um, to represent you all to have a place to represent the Residents of the county, I feel like um, big business is what's taking over and his history is what's now being trying to be forgotten about. Whether it's Big Spring or Mineral, I feel like Helva came in here with her money and that's what the county's looking at. And, and people in the office of the county um, are not looking at her and what's been there for how many years has been there. And all they're doing is considering money and Kelvic and what they represent. And that's, you know, that's what's wrong with us now. We're just looking at business and not looking at the little people who's made the county and the businesses to be able to thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Crawford. Anyone else? Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Um, I'm Robert Zarn. I am the uh, owner of Kelvin Construction and the owner of RDK Holdings, which owns the property. Um, and I would, uh, I would like to uh, express my compassion for Ms. Williams' uh, time here as a resident and certainly understand uh, how she feels. And there, there has been some notes and letters submitted from my attorney uh, looking at some of the historical uh, information that was presented uh, as far as Big Spring goes with the lack of historical uh, value in that name itself um, and with Mineral Springs uh, not being located near these tracks necessarily. Um, 
I, I think that I would like to propose that given uh, this was approved, I, I, I didn't realize the, the process and what naming goes. I followed all the rules, I submitted my plan. I was told the road had to be named and to select a couple of names. I did so, um, it was approved. I didn't go lobby anybody, I didn't try to pay anybody off. It was approved, we continued with that. Once the error was discovered and we were already several uh, you know, lengths down the road with this, um, you know, I, I didn't have any control over that. So right now we have, we have so many things in place uh, with us actually being there now uh, with marketing, getting everybody here uh, to find our location, uh, loans, GIS, mapping, utilities, everything uh, with that name involved, it would be very difficult to make that change. So I would propose that I would like to do whatever I can and assist uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, and Ms. Williams to create that intersection and create whatever name she would like. Um, I'll put the sign up. I will make the intersection clear. I will do whatever I need to do. Um, that section of road that is to be maintained through the industrial portion, the M1 industrial area. Um, I would exempt her from, from any cost sharing of maintenance on that segment of road forever, for as long as she resides. Um, I'm not here to be a bad guy. I'm here to be a good neighbor. Before any of this came up, I went down and introduced myself to her, offered to fix any potholes, push snow for her, receive any kind of packages, help her in any way if trees fall. Um, I'm here to be a good neighbor. I'm here to be a positive influence here in Stafford County and, and not to, to cause this kind of strife. So I, I am sorry for whatever portion I may have been a part of. But. Thank you. Anyone else? Joe Knight, 103 Nautical Cove. I certainly welcome business in our community, and I have very sentimental feelings about thinking of this as Mineral Springs. I truly would like for the business segment to work with the local and local history. You know, all my life I've known about the well at the lower end of Eskimo Hill that provided water for a 24-hour diner and all sorts of business at the top, and it always, the well water stayed to the top. That it's known for that water right there. I, I think that area is so known for its springs, the strong springs, and to keep that seems important to me with our history. And I would love to see us work with the developer, but then on the other hand, I think if he could amend his documents and make them for Mineral Springs, we would all feel really good about it. I know I would. We have to suffer some cost. I, we do that in all phases of this development in. But it is, it, it is, I think, important to think of it as Mineral Springs. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Knight. Would anyone else like to come down and talk? Okay, seeing no one come forward, I will um, close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Um, does anybody on the commission have any questions for staff at this point? Mr. English? Uh, the question would be if, well, if, if the, we would decide to work with the, uh, the developer, the, the business, and helping him change the name, does he, would the county be able to help him with cost to do that, or is that not allowed? That's a question. In other words, if we work with the developer and he said, okay, the county would go half with me and change it, is that possible if we could do that? That takes the cost off of him because it looks like to me it was an honest mistake on, on our part, we as the county part, and I don't feel, and like you say, I know you can't ask for forgiveness and all this stuff, but 
I feel if maybe if the county would help him in, in lieu of changing these names to make it right, is that possible, Dan? Or is that? Mr. English, I'm, I'm not aware of any authority in the state code or in the county code, unfortunately, to be able to uh, assist um, the Kelvick uh, Construction Company in, in that kind of way. Um, typically, the local governments are, are especially limited to the authorities granted, um, so we're working within strict confines, something like that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> any other questions on the commission? That was it. I, I have one question for you, Ms. Hornung. It was brought up by one of the members in the in the public hearing, and I just wanted to ask it because they asked this question in their in their comments. Why wasn't the name Big Spring Lane used when they submitted their original application? Why did we say because it already had a name? So why did we then say, oh, you need to come up with a name? Do we know? Well, it was B Big Spring Lane on the plan, but then it was. Uh, recommended that it would have to change the name because you already had one public road that was Big Spring and then you had this segment that was Big Spring so it's something that should have been done a while ago and this was the opportunity to change the name okay and that was a recommendation to have that segment name be changed okay I just wanted to make sure that we got clarity because that was one of the questions Oh. Any, go ahead, Mr. Hill. Also, there was nothing, Mineral Springs keeps coming up. <coughs> Ms. Knight said that. Was that even in the uh, the realm of names that you know of? It's ever been? Not at that time, but that was, uh, I did look um, look that up with a number, uh, uh, several other road naming schemes, and that is not in our current database of road names. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, no other questions? Mr. McPherson, this is in your district. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, regarding the Board of Supervisors Resolution R17-320, referencing an amendment to the Zoning Ordinance Index of Official Road Names, I move that the Planning Commission recommend to the Board of Supervisors that the private portion of Big Spring Lane, as it's known now, be renamed as follows. The part of the private road between its intersection with public county road Big Spring Lane to the end of the paved portion should be named Kelvick Way. The remaining length of the private road between the end of the paved portion and the terminus of the private road should be named Mineral Spring Lane. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion by Mr. McPherson and a second by Mr. Boswell. Mr. McPherson, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, I would just briefly. I did uh, speak to both Mrs. Williamson and uh, Mr. Zarn of Kelvick Construction. I understand that this is not a solution that everybody uh, might be happy with, but I do think that it does take into account the historical nature at the end of the property, as well as the, uh, the effort that Mr. Zarn has put into his business. So uh, I ask that this motion be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Boswell? Okay. So any other discussion from anyone else? M Mr. Yes, Randall? I have a couple of little things. Um, You know, I, I hate to perpetuate a mistake. I hate to perpetuate something that we've done wrong and that we continue to continue to move that down the road. We made a mistake. We made a mistake from the beginning. Um, I think it was bad timing uh, to decide that one person who was going to build on that had the opportunity to name that road. Um, I don't know if there's any other input taken. Um, it seemed like the only person who lived on the road was the one who drove that decision. Um, if I was to have all the other businesses um, who will eventually be on that road have the chance to decide what name they wanted to make the road, I'm sure they wouldn't all agree that it was going to be Kelvick Way. They would probably all want that road named after their own business. Um, and so I have, I, I'm going to have to uh, say no to the motion um, because I think that we need to decide on what that name's gonna be for the whole road. Um, if, if there was only one person on that road and that road was gonna be that, their road, as, I, as we have throughout the county, then you name that road and that road's gonna be that name because it's only one person that's gonna be using that road. Um, I think to say otherwise would be disadvantageous to those who may want to be on that road down later to realize that that road's been named after their neighbor. 
uh, for no other reason that they were the first one there. Um, and so to that end, I'm gonna have to say no. Thank you, Mr. Randall, anyone else? Okay, no other discussion. We can go ahead and, and vote for the uh, motion that Mr. McPherson said, I can't repeat it all. <laughs> Okay, so the motion passes five to two, and that's it. Now we're moving on to item number two, which is the conditional use permit for Patriots Crossing Car Wash. Uh, for this, we recognize Mr. Brian Gouge. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the Commission. I'm Brian Gouge, Planning and Zoning, presenting the Patriots Crossing Car Wash application. Next slide, please. The request is for a conditional use permit to allow a car wash. This is in the B2 Urban Commercial Zoning District and the HC Highway Corridor Overlay District, or HCOD. The uh, property is a 1.53 acre portion of parcel 2012. The applicant is Don Hart. The agent is Sherman Patrick with Compton and Dooling. However, Jason Hickman is here tonight representing the applicant. This is in the Garrisonville District. The site is located on the south side of Garrisonville Road near its intersection with English Road. The CUP area shown in red uh, applies to a portion of parcel 2012. Parcel 2012 consists of 24 acres and is directly adjacent to North Stafford High School. Uh, other surrounding uses include the PD1 zone Park Ridge neighborhood and Park Ridge Elementary School to the east. Uh, residential development, uh, R1 zone to the northwest, and B3 and A1 undeveloped property to the north. Next slide, please. The comprehensive plan designates this property within the suburban future land use designation and commercial corridor. Commercial corridors are intended to encourage commercial activities that are that uh, have adequate access to adequate transportation facilities to accommodate the uses. A large portion of the site is also located within the resource protection designation that's shown in blue. I know it's sort of overlapped by the commercial corridor, but the resource protection designation extends up. Next slide, please. Parcel 2012 was rezoned to B2 in 2012 with proffers. In 2017, a proffer amendment was approved which replaced a planned recreational facility on the site with other uses. The generalized development plan associated with the proffer amendment is shown here. Uses proposed include several multi-tenant buildings. I'm just gonna highlight all of those. a fast food restaurant, a small office building, and a car wash with, uh, oh, last thing, uh, also a mini storage facility that's 120,000 square feet in size. And total site development is uh, approximately 214,000 square feet. The car wash was envisioned, as you can see here, on the uh, south side of the stream that runs through the property. Uh, however, the current proposed car wash location is on the north side of the stream, generally in the location of where that small office building was proposed. The proffered conditions allow flexibility in the location and types of uses on the property. Mr. Gouge, can I just go back one second? 
yes. the dots at the very bottom of the last circle that you circled, where now the new proposed car wash site is? You see the little yes. track of land yes. with the dots? Mm -hmm. What is that? Those are forested wetlands. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the CUP area is wooded with a sewer line and perennial stream running along the southern boundary. You can sort of, you can faintly see the cleared area for the sewer easement, and then the stream is just below that. There's a 100-foot critical resource protection area, buffer, and some wetland areas associated with the stream. The site is relatively level apart from the stream channel. The stream is fed by a VDOT stormwater management facility to the northwest directly adjacent. That's located here. There's also an unoccupied circa 1887 home on the parcel located outside of the CUP area. Um, an architectural survey was completed for the structure in 2016 and it was found to be not historically significant. The generalized development plan submitted with the application depicts two access points along the main travelway for the development. Um, not sure why my marks carried over. Just give me a second here. Uh, those two access points are here. One is a two-way access point, and the second is an enter-only. The inner only access leads to a two lane queuing area which uh, have capacity for seven vehicles each and um, includes payment stations and automated gates located at the end. The gates allow vehicles to enter the proposed um, 4,000 square foot automated car wash. This is considered a tunnel car wash where vehicles are moved through the building by a conveyor system. After the car wash, vehicles would enter an 18 space parking area um, that's set up with vacuum hoses. Um, and then after the vacuum area, there's a one way drive aisle that leads to the exit. Other features include a dumpster and loading space located at the northwest corner of the property and an inner parcel connection between this site and the pad site to the north. GDP also depicts replanning areas associated with a special exception for encroachment within the CRPA that was uh, approved by the Stafford Chesapeake Bay Board in September of 2017. Other conditions of this approval include a requirement to reshape and restore the stream channel and also a monetary contribution for disturbed areas that could not be mitigated on site. And uh, those replanning areas are shown in GDP as a cross-hatch cross symbol with the little triangles in them. Brian, Brian could you, yes, sorry, Brian. can you go back? Go ahead. So when someone's done and they're leaving the car wash, where, where do they go to get out? Uh, they would go out of this exit right here. This is the two-way Right, and but how, do, how do they get back onto Garrisonville Road? Oh, I'm sorry. They, um, they would turn left and then come up here, and this is a right-in, right-out only entrance, so they would have to take a right. There would be no option for a left there. And that's the road that's shared with uh, North Stafford High School? Yes, they do use that for access to the school. No, that's Garrisonville Road. Garrisonville Road. They'd have to go up to Joyce Street. Like, so let's say you're traveling, what is that, westbound on 610? I think that's my direction. <laughs> westbound. You you'd have to do a, you'd have to go to Joyce Street, which is, where's Joyce Street on here? Yeah. Circle that. Yeah, you'd have to do a U-turn there Here's to get. Joyce. Yeah. Cause, well, Joyce goes to Wolverine Way, but like if you're on Garrisonville Wolverine headed Way. west, that's Wolverine Way. Mm -hmm. you'd have to do a U-turn where he just drew his arrow to get into the site. So the entrance you saw on the GDP is, would be generally here. So um, someone heading westbound on, on Garrisonville would have to U-turn at Wolverine Way to access the site. Okay, and, and then to exit the site. So again, you've finished your car wash, 
mm -hmm. and you're leaving the project complex, whatever you want to call it. Right. How are you, where are you going? You would have to go east on Garrisonville Road because it's a right in, right out only entrance here proposed. Um, otherwise, there are proffered conditions that um, allow for an interparcel connection to Wolverine Way contingent upon school board approval. So if that's ever constructed, then they could exit the site out this way and then come up to the light and either take a right or left on Garrisonville. So, so the bottom line is if, you, if, if you're going uh, westbound on Garrisonville, you'd have to do a U-turn to get into the site. And then, and then if you wanted to go back westbound on Garrisonville, you'd have to You'd have to go, go east, east and then U-turn somewhere and come back, yes. All right, thanks. Um, looking at that graphic, there's also an interparcel connection with the larger parcel to Wellington Drive over in the R1 area. What? It, it appears, if you um, go, go back to that aerial uh, there, mm -hmm. <clears throat> over in the residential area. Are you talking about here? Yes. Is that an interparcel potential? No, the road just ends there. Um, uh, there's no plan for a connection. The way it there. ended, it yeah. kind of led me to think that might be an interparcel connection. And there's also another one of those, those down at the south end of the parcel. They're just uh, sort of stubs. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you. Hey, Brian? Yes. Uh, one quick question. And looking at the plan, I, there was mention of a wetlands, not just the resource protection area, but it mentioned wetlands. Um, That's correct. That you also talked about. Are those primarily created and fed by the storm one, the existing storm monitor, storm water management that you talked about, or uh, are those yes. separate? I believe both the, uh, the, the stream and the wetlands are, are primarily as a result of the, probably the outfall of the storm water management facility. Okay. And do wetlands by themselves carry any special consideration above and beyond RPAs? Because I know wetlands are often a sensitive topic. So uh, wetlands are, or surface waters are regulated by DEQ. So um, as part of this proposal, the, it's my understanding the applicant has gotten a general permit from DEQ for a tenth of an acre of permanent impacts of the wetlands. You can see that here. I'm um, just going to help if I erase some things first. Um, you can see the, the edge of the wetland areas. So they're impacting this right here. Um, and then the remainder of it there, I don't think they intend on disturbing with the development. Okay, so they already have a permit for the, the I believe so, they yes. Okay, thank you. And just for clarification, the VDOT stormwater pond there is solely for Garrisonville Road runoff. It would not provide any protection for this site. Correct. Um, okay. With with the development of the site, they have to provide their own stormwater management facilities, right. whether they be uh, regional facilities or in ground. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Uh, a few other notes. Um, the applicant has indicated that there will be two to three employees at the car wash during business hours. Uh, manual pre-washing of vehicles may occur before they enter the car wash. Um, the car wash will utilize a water recovery system, which will recycle uh, a minimum 50% of the water used. Existing proffers would limit the hours of operation for the car wash to between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. and limit refuse collection and deliveries to between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. <coughs> the proffers on the property include transportation improvements, such as including a, a construction of uh, right turn lane on Garrisonville Road for those headed eastbound and an interparcel connection to the high school. The interparcel connection was um, with the previous car wash location. It was sort of associated with it in that location, but since car wash has moved, um, providing that interparcel connection would be addressed later when that portion of the property develops. And it would also be contingent upon, again, approval by the school board. A transportation impact analysis was not required with this application since an amended analysis was provided with the proffer amendment. And this analysis accounted for the car wash on the property, 
Use is expected to generate around 56 trips per hour during peak hours. And I believe the total vehicles per day was um, 530 for the car wash use with an overall development uh, traffic generation of somewhere around 4,600 vehicles per day. So we're looking at roughly 10% from the car wash. Um, the intent of requiring a CUP for a car wash on the HCOD is to ensure that the use will not have a negative impact on the highway. The proposed use is set back from the road adequately and vehicle stacking for the car wash should not impact the corridor highway. Um, another comment on stacking is um, the ordinance requires that five stacking spaces be provided per wash bay for a car wash. Since there's only one wash bay proposed here, the parking stacking requirement would be five. However, the applicant is proposing two lanes with seven stacking spaces each, so they far exceed that requirement. Finally, you can go back, sorry. Finally, staff finds a proposed architectural design shown here to be consistent with the existing architectural proffers and the neighborhood design standards, which applies to developments within the HCOD. Some comp compatible elements shown on the rendering include the use of brick as a primary facade material, standing seam metal roof, and a variation in a roof line. Okay. Here's an example photo provided by the applicant. The building shown here is Hang pretty- Hang on one second, did you have a question, Mr. McPherson? Yeah, if, yes. if I may, just real quick, uh, a clarification of a point you made just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe I heard you say the reason it's up for conditional use is to evaluate the impact on the on Garrisonville Road. Is there any other deviation or reason why um, it's up for conditional use above and beyond that, what's uh, otherwise permitted on the site? Um, so conditional use permits are also sometimes those that are seen as having a greater impact on adjacent properties through noise or visual impacts or even traffic and things like that. So uh, there are other elements to consider when, um, such as the six elements that are are set for the uh, consideration of conditional use permits. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. So the example photo shown here um, shows a building that's pretty similar in design to the proposed one with a brick facade, standing seam metal roof, same variations in the roof line. At the, for the foreground, you'll see the, um, the setup for the vacuum area and you can see there's, there's these booms that sort of extend out between each parking space. And there's a, there's a tube that kind of connects them all. So the way this works is there's a, single, um, there's a single vacuum pump that supplies pressure to all the hoses. They don't have individual vacuums at each parking space that you would you know, go and pay for or whatnot. So, um, that's all provided via a single vacuum. Proposed conditions include that the site be developed in general conformance with the GDP um, and general conformance with the architectural rendering provided. Uh, the water recycling system is required. Um, the applicant has also expressed that they'd be willing if desired to expand on that condition to state that a minimum of 50% of the water will be recycled. And staff also notes that it's to their benefit that they recycle more just from an economic standpoint. Um, the conditions, proposed conditions would also require that the dumpster be screened with masonry materials similar to the primary building. Signage must use complementary colors and materials. The monument sign must use materials similar to the primary building. And the inner parcel connection is required to the adjacent pad site. Staff finds positives with this are that it's consistent with the comp plan recommendations for commercial development along major roadways, consistent with the established development patterns along Garrisonville. Uh, the proposed building design incorporates recommendations of the neighborhood design standards plan, and the use is cited appropriately to minimize impacts on the corridor highway with no negative aspects noted. Finally, we recommend approval of the application with the conditions pursuant to resolution R1885. And we'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Gouge. Any questions? Just one. Oh, 
Mr. Boswell. Yes. I heard you and I'm looking forward in here, but tell me how many vehicles they estimate to wash there per day. Um, it's estimated in the operational analysis that it's 530 vehicles per day for the wash. Okay. A car wash. Thank you. They're saying 530 cars are going to use that car wash per day? That's the estimation based on the, in the, uh, wrong business. the IT, <laughs> the IT manual, yes. Yeah. Yes, Mr. McPherson. Could you please confirm for me that um, if they recycle 50% of the water, any water that is not recycled goes into the sewer via the sewer easement. It's not drained into the wetlands or to the RPA, correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And there would also be some uh, uh, oil separation and filtering of that water before it even goes into the sewer system. That's part of the, uh, the system. Mr. Bain. I had one question. They mentioned um, stream restoration. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that's going to involve? Do you have any indication on that yet? Um, from what I understand, the uh, I'm just going to sort of draw here somewhere. The current stream bank is is very steep. I think it's pretty shallow, though. Which, um, uh, from from what I know, that sh a stream bank that's steep isn't really that conducive for water filtering. So what they're going to do is come back and lay back the slope some. Okay, what you're drawing on there is not showing up on here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, down, oh, down the corner. Down the corner. Right corner. Right I'm here. looking at the map. Not, 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 yeah, okay. yeah. I see. Don't I get see. don't get confused by the map. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and is that going to impact the wetland area then, um, or is it below downstream of the wetlands? So. Uh, the, uh, the applicant or, or his engineer can correct me if I'm, long, I'm wrong, but the stream itself is considered um, surface waters. So mm -hmm. it's, I believe it's being addressed as part of the, uh, the DEQ permit, but I'll, they'll have to confirm that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Randall? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, could you talk uh, very briefly uh, about um, the access into the parcel, um, what arrangements they've made. I'm, I'm seeing here, I can't see it very clearly, but I'm seeing here that uh, there, there's a turn lane, there's a designated turn lane in. Um, could you talk to that, please? Yes, um, with the proffers, the applicant is required to construct a turn lane. I have those specifics on the uh, details of the turn lane if you'd like them. Please. Um, While you're doing that, really quickly, um, have we checked with VDOT? Are they concerned about the whole right turn, right, right in, and people doing U-turns right at the Wolverine Way and Joy Street, and then immediately slamming their brakes on to turn into the car wash? Um, I know VDOT had several concerns with this, um, with this project, so. Uh, I believe originally the applicant was um, pushing for a medium break to allow um, left ends, left outs. Um, but in their analysis, I think it showed that um, if, if that were provided, it would operate at a poor level of service. So, and it, they'd also have to have a spacing exception from VDOT because of the proximity of the uh, nearby intersections. So I don't believe VDOT was supportive of the medium break. And um, I think there were some other concerns about especially left turn movements at the uh, Wolverine Way for this project. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to derail. I thought that was a quick question. That's fine. <laughs> so the proffer states that subject to VDOT approval, the applicant shall construct a separate right turn lane with a 100 foot long taper along Garrisonville Road to serve the main entrance to Patriots Crossing. And then how long would the right turn lane be to get in? It, it tapers to 100 feet and then it's, a, I believe it's a 200 foot actual right turn lane? I think it, yes, it does have, a, yeah, it says right here, 100 foot taper, 200 foot storage. Okay, in order to turn right into the property? Yes. Okay, correct. now do we have any indication that there's the same, the same ad advantage to when you turn right out of the property? Or are we turning right out of the property directly into traffic? 
Um, as far as a merging area? Yes, please. Um, not that I'm aware of. They, they do show a, a slight taper here, but um, I don't, I don't, I, there's nothing proffered as far as a merging as area. As far as uh, an, um, an, out, an out advantage as, as we would have going in. Right. Okay. Okay, now uh, talk to me about the, uh, the traffic impact analysis. There was done initially, one done initially in 20 2012. 2012. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, based on how many vehicles per day? Was, that, was it based on vehicles per day or was it based on the use of the property? Uh, well, the vehicles per day were based on the assumed uses of the okay. property. And at that time, there was a large um, recreational center. I think it was around 200,000 square feet. Okay. And um, I believe the traffic generation was somewhat similar to uh, what's being proposed now, around 4,600 vehicles. Per About 4,600 vehicles. Yeah. Do you have access to that traffic study that was done? Uh, I can get it. I don't have it with me. All I have is today is the operational analysis okay. that was provided with a proffer amendment. Okay, because I'm, I'm interested, um, we have gotten some feedback from uh, North Stafford um, School, not the school board per se, but the school. The school is very concerned about anything having to do with Joyce and 610. Um, as we know, if you've not been there, uh, don't drive through there between 7 and 9 in the morning and between 3 and 6 in the afternoon. Um, because you can't get very well, very many places very easily. And so he's concerned that that's going to um, cause more of a problem for the schools, people making left that, that U-turn to mm -hmm. get into that um, property. Um, okay, so you don't have it with you. I believe when I looked at it, um, it had several levels of services in the D and E range. Um, and I'm concerned, and that was in 2012, uh, and my guess is since 2012 that traffic's gotten considerably worse. What I'd sent you is actually the operational analysis provided in um, 2017 with the proper amendment, not the original TIA. Okay. So those uh, levels of service you're seeing should be reflective of the proposed development shown here on the GDP. Okay, and do you have, you don't? I have it here, yes. You have those? Okay, so what what's the, what was the determination based on the Joyce and Wolverine um, way level of service? I thought I saw a couple that were that were less than what we asked for in the in the GDP, and so I was just wondering if you have those available. It might make, take me some time to find the numbers. Okay, well th that's fine. It's something we may want to then come back to it, and we can revisit this. Okay, so. Uh, I have it here. Um, Garrisonville Road at Wolverine Way, Joyce Street. Um, existing conditions. It's showing a level of service E for, um, well, I'll, I'll use the overall levels of service. So for, um, for that intersection, it's a D in the AM peak hour and a C in the PM peak hour. Um, projected conditions for, uh, let's see, let me make sure I'm getting this right. Um, okay, so they, the way they did it is they had several different scenarios. Sure, um, scenario one, two, and then one A and right. two A based on. And I that was based on their ability to have a median break and the interparcel connection. Interparcel connection, connection correct. So uh, it really depends on your scenario, but um, well, if we go to scenario two, based on yeah. the fact that there's no interparcel, assuming no interparcel connection and no assuming no median break, that would put us at uh, the second one, correct? Right, and that would be an E and the an AM peak hour and a C and the PM. Okay. Is that the worst of the traffic analysis for uh, analysis two? Uh, for analysis, scenario two. Scenario two, I'm sorry, that's um, correct. It looks like, uh, let's see here. Uh, 
Okay, this is 2020. So looking at 2020, the projection for that, that scenario is a F and a C. That's 2020 without the, uh, I guess there were, there were also a couple that said uh, 2018 current status, 2020 current status, and then 2018 and 2020 with the development. Right. Right, and that is, um, that's with the development under scenario two, projecting out to 2020, and assuming uh, a certain amount has been built at that point. And then they also look at a scenario where um, Garrisonville Road is widened to six lanes in 2020, and under that, it's a um, level of service E, A, M, and C, P, M. Now, w what's the current plan for this development or the widening of 610 down to Shelton Shop? Do you the, the plan for widening? Um, so it, so, so that's a, it's, if that's applicable or not to the conversation? It's, uh, well, Wishful a little, thinking. a little, yeah. <laughs> um, so in the FY18 budget, it was um, shown as having funding from 2020 to 2022, and then construction wouldn't occur until after full funding. Um, however, with the proposed FY19 budget, it's um, dropped off the list. So it's currently, as it's proposed, um, it's with there's the courthouse. no, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not planned for uh, funding anytime soon. Okay, so so based on the analysis that you're looking at, and, and I just pulled it mm -hmm. up, so I'm looking at the same thing now, but based on that, we wouldn't expect with the current situation that the LOS, the level of service for Joyce and Wolverine Way uh, in 2020, that currently being an F, we, we wouldn't expect that to get any better based on the current situation that we have in front of us, correct? Uh, well, it's, it's saying current is uh, actually a D and a C for um, Wolverine Way Joyce Street. Right. But if you so go to under, uh, for total example, future. under 2020 scenario one, um, it's an E and a C. So that's that's a uh, that's right. a little worse. Scenario and two. Then you have F and C, much worse. Much worse. F and E, much worse. F and E, much worse. Right. This scenario is scenario two right. A. Exactly. So, okay, and then, um, yeah, I guess that's my, my number one issue, I guess, is the traffic. Um, it's already bad in that area, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if the current, it, leaving it alone and not doing anything with it um, is going to help or make worse the situation that we already have. My concern, here's my concern. My concern is we build this, um, we build the whole parcel out. Mm -hmm. We haven't made any changes to the light. It's still a right in and right out. And we have literally people stacked up all the way to the back of the lot trying to make that right hand turn without a merge lane, without any options because either they're coming east on 610 or they're all coming out of the high school. There's really no break in traffic with the change of the light. Um, and really you have them stacked up back in that parking lot or back in that parcel you know, for three, four, five, ten minutes, trying to get, make that right turn out when you've only got one, one car at a time. Um, if you stand over there and watch that traffic now between three and five in the afternoon, it's, yeah. yeah. And then the concern of the principal obviously is in the morning when people are coming to school and people are trying to make that U-turn mm -hmm. to get into that right. parcel mm -hmm. um, is also going to make that a detriment. So. I'm, I'm concerned that what the, the current way that it's uh, given to us um, isn't going to help that traffic in any way, shape, or form. Okay. So Mr. anyway, Eng that's my concern. Sorry, Mr. English. Um, what time did we say the car wash was going to be open in the morning? Uh, I believe it was 7. It's going to open at 7 in the morning? Um, at the earliest, yes. So if they change the hours to maybe 8 after school is in session, that may help some of the problem with the traffic, correct? In other words, if 
the school starts at seven in the morning and the car wash opened at nine or eight, mm -hmm. that takes out right. of the, the mix of the, the traffic with the schools, correct? Right. And, um, but I know they can't do anything with the evening traffic because it's going to be open. But I mean, that would mm -hmm. take, and there is a light there. Right. And then I, th I don't think the school, remembering if I think about 20, the school was, uh, was willing to cut the Wolverine Way to make another access road. I don't think they were allowed to do that, right? To my knowledge. I, I, don't, believe. I don't believe so. And, and it talks to it in the proffers as well um, about that. You, is that something you want to uh, address? So. Um, I can give you a, a brief overview of that. Um, so the Wolverine Way connection, as I said before, is contingent upon approval by the school board. Um, there's uh, certain scenarios where uh, if, based on estimates, the applicant shows that it's going to cost more than 275000 to construct the connection, and the connection, I'll back up, the connection is not just the connection to Wolverine Way. There's also a proffered condition of um, them also adding a right turn lane on Wolverine Way for traffic um, heading east on Garrisonville and reconfiguring the uh, signals there to accommodate that. But it's all um, conditioned on uh, the, the maximum they're obligated to spend on that is $275,000. If the estimates show that it's more than that, they can just contribute that amount to the county um, for future improvements. And uh, there's some other elements tied into that, like the um, there's a proffer regarding grading and uh, clearing and grading of some areas on the school site that are sort of tied into um, whether or not the school board issue provides the easements necessary for them to have a public access through their property um, for that inner parcel connection. Um, Mr. McPherson? Just one quick question regarding the proffer. Is this proffer uh, relative only to the car wash that you were talking about or is it for the, in the development of the entire property? Uh, the uh, d development of the entire property for the access property. Okay, thank you. Access. Mr. Apicello. Madam Chairman, uh, we have several new members, uh, almost 50% new members. Couldn't wait till you started <laughs> talking. <laughs> um, who probably don't know the history of this project and how it's evolved over the years, uh, and again, most recently in 2017. I'd like to uh, call attention to the last page, attachment six, page 15 of 15. And um, Brian, can you read the note one that's in the GDP? Page six of the staff report. It's attachment six, oh, attachment page six. 15 and 15. So it's the last page of the staff report. It's the, it's the GDP. <clears throat> trying to get there. Last page. Do you want me to bring it to you? On the GDP. On the GDP, it's uh, under site information. Mm -hmm. It's about midway through the top of the page. Note one. You might I'm need sorry. a magnifying glass. I know, it's so tiny. You're talking about the, the uh, Proffer Amendment GDP, correct? Yep. I apologize. Ah, here we go. Nope, that's not it either. Um, you might have to humor me and read that note for okay. me, Mr. Epson. Pretend I'm Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so, what it says is, this plan is illustrative only and may be phased. Parcel areas, building uses, and areas are representative only and subject to modification. All proposed parcel lines and proposed site improvements shown on the plan may be amended by the owners. That goes on from there. <clears throat> okay, attachment six, page three of 15, proffer number one. Can you read that? Uh, 
apostrophe number one, the applicant agrees that the development of the property shall be in accordance or conformance with the generalized development plan dated December 18th, 2015, revised January 13th, 2017, prepared by Fair, Fairbanks and Franklin. And so far as the general location of buffers, parking areas, travelways, pedestrian access, building height and stories, and transportation improvements identified in Prophet 2. All other improvements shown are illustrative only and are subject to modification. Okay, taken together, the language in the GDP, the note one that you read, and this Proffer 1, what, is, what does that tell us? It tells us there's a flexibility in the it Tells location. us there's a lot of flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what we see there in the design, the nine or 10 buildings, uh, where they're located, the specific uses, and upon which the TIA was developed mm -hmm. may not actually bear out in reality. It could be less intense, it could be more intense, there could be more buildings, there could be fewer buildings. Um, we can get more of one type of building than another type of building, kind of like the discussion we had a couple of weeks ago about another parcel that uh, some uses have more intensity than others and uh, bring about more traffic mm -hmm. uh, than, than other uses might be. So bottom line is, again, no, no maximum number of buildings were proffered, uh, no maximum square footage was proffered, <clears throat> and no maximum daily vehicles per day were proffered. Mm -hmm. So again, the TIA that was discussed in the plan, in the staff report, as it relates to the car wash, uh, it's still somewhat speculative because we don't really know what, what the final result is gonna be. Is that a correct statement? I would say so, yes. <clears throat> okay. So now I'm looking at the GDP um, that was provided for this specific use. <clears throat> Can you read note number one? All right. Get organized here. This plan is illustrative only, parcel area, exact building orientation, and site layout are representative only and subject to modification. All proposed parcel lines are proposed and proposed site improvements shown on this plan may be amended by the owners and to fulfill requirements of final engineering, compliance with state agency regulations and or county development regulations. Okay, and also on the GDP itself in certain areas, I see the phrase written several times, potential development illustrative only. You, you see that on the actual diagram, several places, same mm. words, potential development illustrative only. Yeah. Um, again, how much leeway does this language provide the applicant? I guess somewhat subject to interpretation of the uh, proposed conditions for general conformance with the GDP. So that kind of brings me to my next point. The, one of the conditions says, subject, <laughs> this, this project shall be done in conformance with the GDP. Well, Correct. it seems like there's some caveats in the GDP mm -hmm. that provides a lot of flexibility to the applicant. Is that true? Um, Possibly, I think the, uh, despite, from what I understand at least, um, Dan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, uh, the condition language would, um, since it states as shown on the GDP, it doesn't reference the exact notes on the GDP, so those wouldn't play as much of a role in determining whether it's in conformance or not. Well, let's use an example. So uh, up above the notes, something I've not seen before, it says vehicle uh, vehicles per day entire development forty six thirty two vehicles per day car wash site five hundred and thirty is that guaranteed or not guaranteed as a result of being placed in the GDP? Um, they are not obligated to hold to that trip generation. No. Okay. <coughs> so now I'm looking at uh, page six of twelve. Um, says uh, 
says there's going to be one stall proposed. Is that guaranteed? Is that cast in stone? Um, it is shown on the GDP as one stall. I suppose it could be reinforced with another condition that limits the, uh, the development to only one stall. Okay. And it says a 4,000 square foot automated car. I'm just paraphrasing some of the words that I see in this paragraph on, on page six. It's a mm -hmm. 4,000 square foot automated car wash building. Again, is that something that's guaranteed or not guaranteed? Um, again, the, my previous statement would apply in that um, it is held to somewhat of a standard by the uh, compliance with the GDP requirement, but there could be some flexibility, correct? Okay, and um, there's no guarantee that it can't also turn into a full service car wash, right? Even though it speaks to being an automated car wash, a car wash is a car wash unless otherwise it's more, more uh, generally or more specifically categorized, is that correct? Um, if by full service car wash you mean a uh, I mean with lots of employees washing cars like I've seen, I, I don't know what the name of it is, but there's a car wash. 16 mm -hmm. car wash. Yeah, 16 there's car wash. There's also SNF. See lots of young people out there washing cars. Man, I don't know what your car looks like. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want to see what my car looks like. Um, but I, I just imagine that a full service car wash is probably more intense than a automated car wash. I could be wrong, but that's okay. my my general sense. Is that um, a somewhat accurate statement? I believe I I assume a, a car wash like that would be designed differently, um, have significant differences in the layout. So from that perspective, it probably would not be allowed. That, that's not what I'm reading here, though. I see that they can change the site layout. Site layout representative only and subject to modification right there in the first okay. note. Tells okay. me that, again, they can do something. In my mind, it tells me they can mm -hmm. do something different than what they've put here in, or what's in the staff report. <clears throat> um, I'm on page 8 of 12, and getting back to the full service versus automated. Under operational information, it says, the applicant has indicated there will be between two and three employees at the car wash during business hours. Again, that's not its not guaranteed, cast in stone, unless otherwise specified in a condition, right? Correct. Um, again, I, I'm just going to reiterate that uh, I'm looking at the next page, page 9, which talks about 56 vehicle trips per, per hour during the weekday PM period. Again, that was built on, in my opinion, a somewhat speculative TIA. So. Could be less, could be more. We won't know until um, until the entire project is built out and, and until we know exactly what kind of car wash is going to happen here, right? Right. I suppose so. It could it could vary depending on the uh, the actual use. Um, from what I recall from that IT e manual, there's very limited data that um, there weren't many samples for the car wash use that they base their averages on. So. There could be quite a bit of fluctuation there. So, so the bottom line, based on the original uh, GDP, I'm not sure which governs, whether it's the, this GDP or the, the GDP specific to the car wash, but there's a lot of flexibility in both the original GDP that governs the whole site mm -hmm. and certainly what seems to me some flexibility in the GDP associated with um, the specific car wash. I would say more flexibility in the and the proper amendment GDP and tighter, but still some flexibility um, based on the language of the proposed CUP. Right, but the absence of conditions or conditions put in could kind of get back to what they said they were going to do and make sure mm -hmm. it's not going to be more intensive than that could they might otherwise be able to do in the absence of yeah. such language. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I think we're good now. We can let the applicant come up. If you if you want to hit the firing squad. And when you start off, just state your name, address, and yeah. 
You do have more than three minutes, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Chair uh, members of the commission. My name is Jason Hickman. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Compton and Dooling. I'm here today on behalf of Patriots Crossing Car Wash, specifically the applicant, Don Hart, his representative, Donnie Hart, and uh, the engineer, uh, Justin Franklin, who is here with me as well. I want to start out by probably clarifying a couple of things because I, I want to make sure we start out on a sound foundation. The number of car washes per day is 206, not 500 plus. The reason for the CUP, the only reason for the CUP is because this is in the HCOD area and that's why it's required. Um, this particular development was the subject of a prior proffer amendment in 2017. The only thing that is the subject of this CUP is the flipping of the car wash from one area to another area within the same development. There has not been a change to the use of the overall development. Additionally, there are limitations placed upon this development, including the fact that phase one is limited to a maximum of 50,000 square feet, and phase two can only be developed, um, there are certain triggers that include the expansion and development of Garrisonville Road. Um, those are both in the original 2017 proffer conditions. I'll also note that the, the actual, um, one of the questions that uh, the commissioners asked was relative to the use of the property. Uh, we had proposed an additional condition, which I can hand up if you like, which says the car wash shall be an express exterior tunnel single stall car wash. That was an additional condition that we had agreed to that wasn't included with what you have. <clears throat> so if you can go to the, sorry Jeff, I'll wait for you. Thank you very much. So this particular overview shows not only the site location, but the, the, basic, uh, uh, the basics of this particular proposal. Uh, we're in B2 zoning. It's 1.5 acres of a 24-acre uh, commercial development. As I said, the conditional use permit is required because it's within the HCOD. It's 200 feet from Garrisonville Road, 400 feet from residential, 160 feet from Stafford High School, from the property line, the building is. Uh, if you could go to the next, thank you. Uh, you can see from uh, these two, uh, the one on the left being the generalized development plan and the one on the right being a blow up of that same uh, provision. You can see uh, the character of the particular development it was moved, as I say, from the uh, left, from the right of the stream pattern to the left. The um, RPA wetlands issues have all previously been dealt with through the special exception with the Chess Bay Board. There are very specific requirements that the applicant has to fulfill as part of the special exception. Um, that special exception has to be met. The applicant doesn't have any choice. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. The use limitations, as was discussed previously, uh, there's an hours of operation not to exceed 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Car wash shall utilize a water recycling system that captures approximately 50% of the water. Dumpster, dumpster shall be screened with masonry materials that are similar to the primary building. Uh, no portable signage may be used on the property and the inter interparcel connection must be provided to the north of the car wash site. There are two interparcel connections relative to this particular property. Uh, one doesn't apply. 
<clears throat> and that's the interparcel connection relative to Ro Wolverine Way and the school. It does not pl apply and is not triggered by this development. The only interparcel connection that is subject to this particular development of the 1.5 acres is the interparcel connection, right? Is that? Right in this area. Did that show up? It didn't show up. Oh. We'll just skip that, but it's it's I apologize. the uh, ink ink layer is malfunctioning. The, so it is the uh, the as you exit, and this is actually a better depiction of the uh, right in, right out, and the travel way as well. So let me start there. So as you're on Garrisonville Road, there's a 200 foot storage and a 100 foot taper that turns as a right in only onto the access way. And then when you get to the first entrance of the uh, commercial car wash, you can see that's the interparcel connection that's required. You go to the second entrance, that's the main entrance that would be utilized by those people who are coming through the car wash. As was stated, um, there's a double stacking required, five uh, stacking. This has seven per lane and there's two lanes, so there's 14, which far exceeds the requirements. The, the access and the routing is as shown. Um, it's easy access inside the car wash. The road servicing the car wash site um, and future development would be developed as part of this. And there is a, as we've already discussed, the right in, right out. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, the proposed renderings, which you have already seen, uh, staff has already pointed out the positive attributes, so I'll move forward with that. You can go to the next slide, please. And then the vacuum bays. Um, I am certainly happy to answer any questions that you have. I will note that there's um, the TIA that was done and then the subsequent analysis that was done was done relative to a recreational facility, which had substantially <coughs> more trips per day than the use as a car wash and the commercial use that this was modified to and which was approved in uh, 2017 with the proffer amendments. The, um, if there's additional questions, I'm available to answer them. Uh, Mr. Hart's here to answer questions as well as the engineer, <coughs> Mr. Franklin as well. Anyone to the left have any questions? Anyone to the right? Mr. Randall? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, I, I guess uh, the concern I have is, again, the traffic. Um, did wh What was the analysis uh, for the reason why we didn't have an out lane just as we did an in lane, a uh, taper and then a stacking um, off of Garrisonville Road? Was there a particular reason why we chose not to have a right out merge lane as well? I believe the short answer was it, it wasn't required, it wasn't suggested. Justin, do you want to address that specific? Let me have the engineer address sure. it specifically. That's fine. Uh, typically, that's not actually something that's um, that VDOT encourages, primarily because it um, actually creates a second conflict point because you have different when you have one entrance without an acceleration lane, or protected acceleration lane, that is, what ends up happening is you end up with a conflict point at the entrance and then a conflict point where the cars are trying to merge over. Um, it's discouraged. Uh, VDOT is concerned about their main roadway and functionality of Route 610 in this case. Sure. Uh, if there's a decreased level of service on the private side, on the project side, that's of less concern. Again, it's it's not typical, and that's why it wasn't done. Okay. Uh, typically, if um, uh, you'll you'll note, uh, for example, if you see an acceleration lane, uh, usually they're for left turns out, and they're usually protected. Um, we have another project, as a matter of fact, that uh, and utilizes that approach. Um, that's because when you're making a left out, you have two directions that you're looking, sure. and you need that protected left in a high volume situation, a right is a permissible uh, movement. 
Uh, so the, um, the thought process, you just don't go get out in traffic unless you have room to accelerate in the first place. Okay. Does right. that answer your question, you. hopefully? It, it, it does. I, I, I recommend, I recognize that VDOT may rec not recommend it. Um, I, I'm just not sure how you're gonna fix the, you know, five years from now, 610 may or may not have been widened. Um, you have three commercial locations, three <laughs> multi-tenant buildings, a car wash, a, a, a fast food restaurant. You have 4,000 cars in and out. Um, and really, there won't be any way for them to get, make a right-hand turn out of that during those peak hours. That, <coughs> that, you know, that's my number one concern. And, um, and, and, and I when I look at the level, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, and, and then when I look at the level of service, I, I know we didn't do a new one. I know it was based on uh, recreational facility that we had originally, um, but I think that recreational facility or not, um, I think the level of service that we've seen in couple of, in a number of those intersections, both at Joyce and at Park, Park Ridge, um, has proven to be much less than what our GDP allows for, and and I and I think without any any compensation, any mitigation for those. Um, we, we get in a problem of, am I making the traffic situation worse um, without any steps to try to help that? And I think the board contemplated some of that because if you look at the approved proffers, um, there is a provision on phase two relative to the development of additional parcels or the, the additional development of the parcel that it could only be done uh, full build out of the uses on the property shall be allowed only if the planned upgrade of Garrisonville Road from four lanes to six lanes along the property frontage is completed or a revised traffic study demonstrates that the development proposed at the time of the site plan approval is in compliance with the minimum VDOT level of service standards. That's part of the already existing approved proffered conditions. It's at page seven, proffer, 4B, I believe it is, 4B little 2. And then the other limitation that I referenced previously is on the page before, and that is the maximum square footage of the building is uh, 50,000 square feet. And this particular building. Um, of the building or a phase one? Uh, the gross, phase one uh, gross. The total, the total amount of phase one build. Is that what you're I saying? I just closed the page, I apologize. Uh, the first area is anticipated to include retail-oriented and retail uses shall be limited to a maximum of 50,000 square feet. 50,000 square feet. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so now is the public hearing <clears throat> portion of the meeting. So if anyone would like to come down to the podium and speak for three minutes, <clears throat> again, when the yellow light turns on, you have one minute left. When the red light turns on, please um, cease your comments and please state your name, address, and rec uh, magisterial district. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mary McMahon. I live at 202 Southampton Court in Park Ridge, which is the Gates. It's a small community right behind uh, Caldwell Banker, and we are adjacent to this property. I am also the president of the Homeowners Association for that small subdivision which is part of Park Ridge. Um, we have a number of concerns, as you can well imagine. Uh, noise, traffic, um, the stream and the restoration for that stream. Um, in particular, that stream goes along the back edge of our community. It holds water the entire time, all even in the summertime. It drains underneath Park Ridge uh, Boulevard uh, which is maintained by VDOT. And we do have problems with that undergrounding under um, Parkway Boulevard. If you wanna take a peek, um, VDOT's been out and tried to fix that undergrounding uh, a number of times. And we've actually had erosion where we've been worried that um, Parkway would cave in. Um, that then drains into a large retention pond that is owned by Park Ridge Homeowners Association, and we're responsible for maintaining it. 
So the park, uh, the stream restoration is a very important part of this uh, property development. Um, we realize that something's going to go in there at some point. Uh, you can't have 24 acres of prime property and not have something go in. The developer has worked with us and actually moved the car wash from one end of the property over so that it wasn't right next to us, uh, which we deeply appreciate. Um, but we really want to see the stream restoration done properly. Um, and, you know, the traffic is a big concern for us as well. Uh, just getting into our little division, um, we're right up there, right next to 610. So getting in and out of our little community is tough sometimes. But thank you very much for your consideration and for your thoughtful deliberations tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Joe Knight, 103 Nautical Cove. You know, today, it may seem a cinch, but it really isn't. It's difficult getting the commercial developers in the area, and we work hard at it. This property was zoned uh, some years ago, as Steve mentioned, and the developer who got all the proffers and set everything up went defunct with the downturn of the economy. Went back to the two elderly property owners. Uh, one of them in very bad health. They've had a time trying to pay the taxes on this stone property that they thought was sold. They grew up there. Now we found a developer who has come into the picture and taken it over and Tempting to bring us more commerce, which we badly need to offset the cost for our schools and other needs in the county. And I, as I said before, and I was sentimental about that road deal, hadn't planned on that one, but I truly believe we ought to work together and try to make this thing happen. I know the developer has met with the community and been over backwards trying to make them satisfied with what he will do. I think it can be a benefit when this is developed to the schools. It's a close, accessible place for the, the school children to even have part-time jobs. It may eliminate the need to go on the road for some of uh, the needs they have uh, with as school students and teachers. And I really believe it's a good place for it. I know it's tough to accept change for anyone, and Park Ridge has been reasonable. I can recall so much when Aquia had first was developed, and no one wanted it, and they thought it was going to be deplorable, and they wouldn't get in and out. Now, of course, we have not got anything, and they're dying over that. They really need it, want it, and we want it. So I'd like to think that the schools, too, would work with us. and we would all pull together and support and encourage the commerce that we have we're seeking to develop here so thank you thank you miss knight anyone else okay seeing no one else i'll bring it back to the commission and close the public hearing um does anyone on the commission have any questions for staff uh, I, mr I randall brian if i if i could please just Again, this is this is for my education uh, as being new. Um, with the build out of the rest of the first phase one for the fifty thousand square foot, um, is it conceivable that this could be the only time this could come before us for a CUP? That this would be the only one we would see based on whatever use they decide to put in the rest of the. Um, well, the the GDP did envision a fast food use, so with a drive through. With, uh, associated with fast food restaurant, there would have to be another conditional use permit if they choose to. If they choose to use that. that. But, but yes. this could be the only one based on whatever they decide to use for the rest of the phase one. Is that correct? It could be correct. Okay. Yes. So if we, if we were to, um, if we wanted to make sure that that frontage road was, uh, not the frontage, but the frontage area was done right, that maybe there's a sidewalk that allowed, as Ms. Knight mentioned, 
you know, being able to get from the school, assuming that the interparcel connection it doesn't exist, and I'm going to make that assumption at this point, that there would be need to some way that we could get kids to this fast food restaurant or to the school or, or to the car wash to work or, or wherever they needed to be, this would be maybe the only bite at the apple we would have in order to ensure that that would happen? Uh, well, on the, the sidewalk point, there, there actually are proffers that require them to construct a sidewalk um, along with the interparcel connection. So that would accommodate the pedestrian connection between the uses. Is that the entire length of the property? Uh, I believe so, yes, all the way to Wolverine Way. Okay, I didn't, okay, that's my bad. I didn't see that in there as far as the profit was concerned there. Okay. Uh, he, he's talking about the inner parcel, yeah. Okay. okay. All, right. all right, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Randall, this is in your district. What would you like to do? In regards to conditional use permit 17152112, um, I motion that we defer this uh, until a meeting later to see if we can resolve in some way or shape or form the, the traffic issues. Um, I, I'm not in good conscience being able to take an LOS from E or F in some cases um, and, and, and add more um, traffic to that without trying to mitigate that in some way. So I defer, I would motion to defer this until another meeting. Okay. Uh, Dan, do we need a meeting date? And since, well, it's not really a public hearing, so it's unfinished business. I do recommend uh, a date uh, certain. Okay. Mr. Randall, do you have a specific uh, time I will frame? be uh, out of the country on the 9th, so I recommend the second meeting in May. I okay. don't know what's the date uh, I for that. I think that might be May. 23rd, maybe? 23rd, that sounds about right. Let me double check. Yep, May 23rd. Okay, so you're making a motion to defer to May 23? Yes. And I think our date action on here is July 20th, so we do have plenty of time. Do we have a second? I'll second that. All right, so a motion by Mr. Randall, second by Mr. Apicello. Mr. Randall, do you have any further comments? Uh, just one quick comment. Um, we had a great discussion. I had a great discussion with the developers. I really appreciate um, talking to me coming down and, and telling what we had. Um, I, I, I think that the car washes, are, it, the way it looks, uh, I think it's necessary. I think it's something that we, we, we need here. Uh, the current one that we have, I don't think meets the needs. Um, but again, to the point that um, we have a traffic, uh, a major traffic issue in this area, especially uh, around Garrisonville Road. And, and I think we need to do uh, something or talk about what we what something we can do to help mitigate that. So, um, to that end, uh, is why I'm asking to defer it. Mr. Apicello, uh, Madam Chairman, I again I think that uh, might want to take a look at the conditions and see if there's any way to uh, mitigate uh, what I think are continuing uncertainties about how this project may be developed and specifically this specific um, uh, use. So, um, I don't think it's as tight as could, as it could be and and maybe Mr. Randall could work with the developer and or council to see how we can get there. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, so now we can vote. Motion passes 7-0. Okay, now moving on. Um, items three, four, five, and six are continued to other dates that are highlighted on the agenda. There's no new business. Planning Director's report, Mr. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, my report consists of uh, an update from the Board of Supervisors meetings from last week. Um, in particular, the Community and Economic Development Committee, they talked about moving forward with phase three of the cluster implementation. Uh, so that's anticipated that that will come up the next board meeting with a referral to the Planning Commission to give you some authority to do a deep dive on cluster development um, to look at the regulations in total and also possibly look at the map that was adopted and make adjustments as the Commission seems uh, deems fit. So that's a look, look forward to the future. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. That Sounds like a lot of work. Includes my report. <laughs> <laughs> County Attorney's Report. 
Madam Chairman, I have no report. Thank you. Okay, committee reports, landscaping. Final report is on the 25th. Do you have anything you want to say today? Landscaping, who's landscaping? You're landscaping. Who's landscaping? <laughs> who's on landscaping? You're I'm on landscaping. Yeah, oh my God. <laughs> yes, I, I am. I thought you were. I thought I is. <laughs> right, he's right. The final report is the 25th. Okay. <laughs> I'm on so many committees, I don't know. All right. Oh, my goodness. So All right. A1 subcommittee. I, that's, I know that I'm on that committee. So. All right. Yeah, so we what's met, going on with that? We met, we met last night. We're trying to uh, tie up a few loose ends on that, and we're going to be meeting again sometime in uh, probably the first part of May. Uh, Susan's going to try to get some uh, uh, some things that we need to look at and some definitions, and she's going to have some speakers in so we can figure out some things. Great. And cemetery subcommittee, you're on that one too. That's With me, said, you're on all three. Yeah. Um, we're we're working on the report, and hopefully that's why you understand it's been delayed because Daryl's on 15 subcommittees. <laughs> um, okay, so cluster development committee, um, Mr. Randall. Uh, yes, you have uh, in front of all the commissioners is the um, effort that we've put together over the last two weeks. Um, Mike is here to help help define <coughs> this for us. I'm gonna let, turn the time over to him and let him walk us through this. Um, the expectation that we'll, uh, we'll vote on something to be able to present um, for, for the public hearing. Yes, good evening, uh, Madam Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, Mike Seroff, the Planning and Zoning Department. So yeah, you received uh, this evening and, uh, and uh, also via email the uh, work that is the product of, um, of the uh, Cluster Development Committee uh, the Cluster Development Committee met on April 5th and April 9th, and uh, both of those meetings, they, they reviewed uh, the proposed um, zoning ordinance amendments and proposed comp plan amendments. Uh, also, we, we did go over kind of the, the whole phasing and where this, these amendments fit into the whole process. You know, this is kind of seen as phase two of the whole process. Phase one was uh, the board um, adopting a uh, the, uh, it was the option three map of where cluster development areas are will be permitted. And then uh, this phase two uh, is looking at some limited adjustments to the uh, zoning and, and uh, comprehensive plan. Um, so just kind of um, reviewing the changes uh, briefly, starting with the uh, ordinance uh, amendment. The, and I'm just going to hit the high, highlights, um, uh, starting on, um, on page three. Uh, we did um, provide to you some kind of last minute uh, changes that, uh, that we discovered. Um, the provision at the bottom of page three that's highlighted in yellow, that um, was actually adjusted under the um, first phase. Um, and so for Consistency purposes, staff is recommending that that be adjusted and that section just simply state the cluster subdivision as a, as a conditional use permit use with increased density and a reference to table 3.1B, which then lists the maximum density that uh, somebody can achieve uh, by getting a conditional use permit for a cluster That's on the bottom of page three, is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay. Then moving on uh, to the bottom of page four, the uh, committee did go through the um, table of, um, of uses and standards uh, as it relates to open space and lot area. And um, before it, the table continues to the next page, but before we get to the next page, there was some time spent on open space and lot area. And, um, and so the committee was looking to um, increase the R1 uh, zoning district uh, open, minimum open space requirement from 30% up to 40% of the total tract area. And uh, initially, the committee had recommended that the minimum lot area increase from 8,000 to 10,000 square feet. Uh, but uh, they, we, we, as staff, were directed to kind of evaluate that to see if, uh, make sure those adjustments would be appropriate because if we made these adjustments and it didn't allow somebody to achieve the, uh, the uh, maximum density, then that would be um, uh, an inappropriate change. So we did provide you uh, an evaluation. That's uh, page six of the, um, if we can kind of jump ahead uh, while we're here to that evaluation. And uh, so I went through 
and uh, did a did a, um, a scenario just to test those proposed um, minimum lot sizes and, and open space uh, standards on a 100 acre property, applying the maximum density uh, uh, where somebody could potentially uh, achieve 225 dwelling units. Uh, from that, with a 40% open space, there of course would be a 40 acre um, open space requirement. Uh, from that, you'd have a remaining uh, development area of 60 acres that somebody would have to work with. Uh, so in that, estimating the total area that those 225 lots would, would make up, in addition to a percentage of the land, um, which is an estimate that we've, we've used um, of 15% of the total area to make up right-of-way, utility and stormwater e water management easements, which also wouldn't be allowed to be included in the open space. Uh, that total uh, development area that would be needed would be 66 acres greater than the 60 acre development area. So that would be, um, would not allow somebody to achieve that maximum density. So went through some options and um, determined a minimum lot size that would allow this to work. So that um, we, uh, basically, we were able to make that work with a lot minimum lot size of 8,600 square feet. So, um, under this scenario, the the same the same scenario, you'd have a, a development um, need a development area need of 59.42 acres, which would be under the 60 percent uh, development envelope or 60 acre development envelope. So, um, this then would lead to an adjustment from. 8,000 square feet of a minimum lot area to 8,600 square feet for a minimum lot area because the uh, committee also wanted us to uh, focus on adjusting the lot area before we uh, addressed or did anything with open space. Yeah, Mike, yeah. if I could just yeah. for a second. Um, the, when we did the initial calculation um, or the initial uh, yeah, calculation, I guess is the word, um, of 30% of the original 30% and 8,000 square foot, um, we recognize that there's a there was a, a, a minimum amount or a, some amount of land that was not covered in either the open space requirement or the minimum lot size, mm -hmm. and that was kind of the the, the genesis of the uh, of the changes. Um, and to the to the rest of the commission, we made the decision that um, minimum open space was more important than lot size. Um, that is subject to change uh, to the commission. If the commission is interested in more in lot size and open space, we definitely can can look at leaving the lot size a little lower, a little higher, and moving the open space down. Uh, the decision, though, at the commission at the committee was to uh, keep the open space at forty percent and then adjust um, the lot size, which is why the lot size was what we were looking at, um, or what Mike went went ahead and looked at. And, um, and so. On this, though, that's 8,600 square feet, so it went up. The lot it minimum lot size went up, and so did open space. So yes, right. it, did, it, it went lots. up. It just didn't go up to what we expected. I guess yeah. I, we didn't take into consideration the 15% the um, off the top that we would use for easements and such and roads or um, driveways and those types of things. So using the 15%, the lot size did go up, but it, was, it only went up as a priority of leaving the open space at 40%. So okay. thank you. I just okay. needed to explain that. Okay. Um, then moving on to the um, the next page, page, page five, the top page five, the uh, additional adjustments to the table. Um, the committee uh, adjusted minimum side yards uh, in A1, increased the side yard from 10 feet to 20 feet. That's consistent with the conventional subdivision in A1 and increase the side yard in R1 from eight feet to 10 feet, just straight um, with no adjustments there. And then uh, the minimum rear yard um, row was added in. The table initially did not have that, uh, that line item. And that basically is a carryover from uh, what was being deleted in um, table uh, 3.1. So there was no, no change there, just adding that information in. Um, Section 28-39, special regulations. There's a uh, new subsection Y uh, dealing with cluster uh, subdivisions. Um, this uh, section makes some adjustments to basically exclude 
uh, most of stormwater management areas and utility and access easement areas from the minimum open space calculations. Uh, the main adjustments um, are to subsection, subsection B and C. That's um, dealing with uh, uh, surface and underground stormwater management area. Basically, um, the committee looked through that, and in red, you can see the adjustments made by the committee. Um, to, to you know, and, and what, what the adjust, main adjustment made is was basically using the storm drainage easement area as a defining factor in determining where what would be excluded uh, from open space because that is a, a known uh, limit that is uh, included on construction plans. It's platted out, so we can we can define that and and measure against against that. And then um, to subsection D, um, this uh, originally was, were two parts, and one of the last changes the committee made was uh, kind of combining the this item relating to utility and access easements into one item. It, well, it was, originally, it was all focused on utility easements. The committee wanted the this to also address and include access easements that. Um, the uh, utility and access easements which could be included in the open space, but the area uh, of the first 50 feet um, would not um, be included in the uh, in, as counting towards open space. Um, and then beyond 50 feet, if there you have a wider easement, um, the area beyond 50 feet that might be utilized for an, a permitted open space use, that area could count towards. Uh, towards required uh, open space. And yeah, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Bain and Kristen, are you okay with that language as it's written? Okay, that seems to then, Steve, you're good? Okay, yeah. Mike, you did a good job with that because we, yeah. we, we, we were a little hesitant as to what that language is gonna be when we left on yeah. on Monday, and so that yeah. you did a good job rewriting that. Right. And that. And that exception, you know, it, it it adds it includes the access easement section. Uh, we don't have any typically see any access easements beyond or wider than 50 feet, so that that really wouldn't the the exception area really is then handed uh, addressing um, utility easements greater than 50 feet. That's a, a, a quick summary of the um, proposed ordinance uh, changes, and then um, we have uh, two uh, parts of the um, comp plan. Uh, amendment. Uh, we looked through one, but I, I, I broke it up into two, two parts. Um, and many of the uh, uh, changes to the comp plan, and this is uh, being on page seven of the handout tonight. Um, many of the changes uh, addressed um, uh, minor things like writing style, formatting, grammar. Uh, some of it was uh, ensuring that the um, policy language was carried over um, from chapter two to chapter three. And then, um, and then to make sure that references to other parts of the comp plan were were cited accurately, uh, so we worked through all those uh, all those details. Um, chapter three was also adjusted. Uh, there are three sections of recommendations dealing with um, cluster subdivision criteria. Mike, so we have Mike, if I could, mm -hmm. just to be clear, um, chapter th chapter three point nine is a new chapter, correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, and that's a new chapter, yeah. and it's base, and it's taking this chapter two goals, objectives, and policies, removing it from chapter two, and moving it into a new chapter three point nine, specific, specifically referencing cluster subdivisions. Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thanks for that. Yes, and just to add to what Mr. Randall said, I think we all recognize that the use of the word contiguous is what makes this uh, chapter especially effective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, we have uh, criteria th into th in broken into three sections. Part A is uh, general criteria that would apply to any cluster subdivision. Part B would be uh, referring to cluster subdivisions that are proposed inside the urban services area. And cluster C, um, criteria for cluster subdivisions outside the urban service area. And so language was modified to clarify what sections applied and somebody, if somebody's um, submitting a Cluster subdivision in inside the urban service area sections A and B will will apply, and if they're outside of the urban service area, sections C and A apply. So that was kind of uh, clarified as well. Um, the uh, last part, um, kind of beginning on page ten, was kind of the the 
text that uh, is is mainly associated with the map. Um, this was uh, a section that was the, the commission had already initiated for uh, a public hearing, and that's going to be at your next meeting. But the committee did did look at this language, and um, and make some made some adjustments to to clarify the description on uh, of the map and how it was developed. And so, uh, you know, and and the fact that uh, this has been advertised and um, the staff would uh, would suggest that if their commi committee or the commission as a whole had any modifications to this section, they should probably wait until the public hearing since it's been advertised. And uh, that's a quick summary of, of where we are. Thank you, Mr. Zarath. Does anyone on the commission have any questions for Mr. Zarath or any comments on the work that was done so far? Yeah? So if nobody has any additional comments, do we have a motion to do anything with it? Do we want more time? <coughs> Uh, Madam Chair, <laughs> I, I make a motion that we um, approve as written and move it forward to a public hearing. All right, do we have a second? Second. Okay. I, just for clarification, the, the, which parts are we moving forward and which parts are we not moving forward? Because I thought I just heard Mr. Zaraf say the last page before the map is something we want to wait on. Oh, no, he so, that. sorry, so, yeah, so for clarification, uh, what you would can be considering for it to move forward would be the ordinance amendments and then all of the um, comprehensive plan amendments with the exception of the page 10 and 11. Yeah, that's what I said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to amend your motion? I will amend my motion okay. that says that we will approve the ordinance and the Language is written page seven through nine and move that forward to a public hearing. Second again. All right, so Mr. Randall made the motion. Mr. McPherson <coughs> seconded. Uh, any comment, Mr. Randall? Uh, no, just to thank those who worked with me on the committee to get this done. We were able to move it through fairly quickly and as staff as for their efforts to help us as well. Thank you. Mr. McPherson? Okay, anyone else? Okay, and I'll just say really quickly because I know we want to get out of here. Thank you guys to the commission. First of all, you guys were three newbies, and you did so awesome. You guys really took this ordinance. You got it done quickly. You worked with staff. Staff was very, very helpful in this process as well. And so thank you guys for working so diligently to get us something that we didn't have to really mark up tonight, and that's that's really great. Um, so anyway, that's all I wanted to say. So we have a motion on the floor. We can vote now. All right, motion passes 7-0. Okay, so chairman's report, I have none. Um, other business, TRC, I think Mr. English, Commissioner English, you have one in your district. Approval of minutes, we have none. I'll just make a quick note in case anyone's listening at home. Um, staff is working on the minutes, um, and so there's been, been a little bit of a delay just because of staff overload and, and, and the <coughs> amount of minutes that are kind of in the docket waiting. So they'll get to us as soon as possible, and uh, this meeting is adjourned.